Part One of Olalla. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Olalla, by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part One. Now said the doctor, my part is done, and I may say with some vanity, well done. It remains only to get you out of this cold and poisonous city, and to give you two months of a pure air and an easy conscience. The last is your affair. To the first I think I can help you. It falls indeed rather oddly. It was but the other day the Padre came in from the country, and as he and I are old friends, although of contrary professions, he applied to me in a matter of distress among some of his parishioners. This was a family— but you are ignorant of Spain, and even the names of our grandees are hardly known to you. Suffice it then that they were once great people, and are now fallen to the brink of destitution. Nothing now belongs to them but the residencia, and certain leagues of desert mountain, in the greater part of which not even a goat could support life. But the house is a fine old place, and stands at a great height among the hills, and most salubriously, and I had no sooner heard my friend's tale than I remembered you. I told him I had a wounded officer, wounded in the good cause, who was now able to make a change, and I proposed that his friend should take you for a lodger. Instantly the Padre's face grew dark, as I had maliciously foreseen it would. It was out of the question, he said. Then let them starve, said I, for I have no sympathy with tatterdemalion pride. Thereupon we separated, not very content with one another. But yesterday, to my wonder, the Padre returned and made a submission. The difficulty, he said, he had found upon enquiry to be less than he had feared, or, in other words, these proud people had put their pride in their pocket. I closed with the offer, and, subject to your approval, I have taken rooms for you in the residencia. The air of these mountains will renew your blood, and the quiet in which you will there live is worth all the medicines in the world. Doctor, said I, you have been throughout my good angel, and your advice is a command. But tell me, if you please, something of the family with which I am to reside. I am coming to that, replied my friend, and indeed there is a difficulty in the way. These beggars are, as I have said, of very high descent, and swollen with the most baseless vanity. They have lived for some generations in a growing isolation, drawing away, on either hand, from the rich who had now become too high for them, and from the poor, whom they still regarded as too low. And even to-day, when poverty forces them to unfasten their door to a guest, they cannot do so without a most ungracious stipulation. You are to remain, they say, a stranger. They will give you attendance, but they refuse from the first the idea of the smallest intimacy. I will not deny that I was piqued, and perhaps the feeling strengthened my desire to go, for I was confident that I could break down that barrier if I desired. There is nothing offensive in such a stipulation, said I and I even sympathize with the feeling that inspired it. "'It is true that they have never seen you,' returned the doctor politely, "'and if they knew you were the handsomest and most pleasant man that ever came from England, where I am told that handsome men are common, but pleasant ones not so much so, they would doubtless make you welcome with a better grace. But since you take the thing so well, it matters not. To me, indeed, it seems discourteous. But you will find yourself the gainer.' The family will not much tempt you. A mother, a son, and a daughter, an old woman said to be half-witted, a country lout, and a country girl, who stands very high with her confessor, and is, therefore, chuckled the physician, most likely plain. There is not much in that to attract the fancy of a dashing officer. And yet you say they are high-born, I objected. Well, as to that I should distinguish, returned the doctor. The mother is, not so the children. The mother was the last representative of a princely stock, degenerate both in parts and fortune. Her father was not only poor, he was mad, and the girl ran wild about the residencia till his death. Then, much of the fortune having died with him, and the family being quite extinct, the girl ran wilder than ever, until at last she married. Heaven knows whom, a muleteer, some say, others a smuggler, while there are some who uphold there was no marriage at all, and that Felipe and Olalla are bastards. The union, such as it was, was tragically dissolved some years ago, but they live in such seclusion, and the country at that time was in so much disorder, that the precise manner of the man's end is known only to the priest. 
if even to him. "'I begin to think I shall have strange experiences,' said I. "'I would not romance if I were you,' replied the doctor. "'You will find, I fear, a very grovelling and commonplace reality. Felipe, for instance, I have seen. And what am I to say? He is very rustic, very cunning, very loutish, and I should say, an innocent. The others are probably to match. No, no, Signor Comandante, you must seek congenial society among the great sights of our mountains, and in these at least, if you are at all a lover of the works of nature, I promise you will not be disappointed." The next day Felipe came for me in a rough country cart, drawn by a mule. And a little before the stroke of noon, after I had said farewell to the doctor, the innkeeper, and different good souls who had befriended me during my sickness, we set forth out of the city by the eastern gate, and began to ascend into the Sierra. I had been so long a prisoner, since I was left behind for dying after the loss of the convoy, that the mere smell of the earth set me smiling. The country through which we went was wild and rocky, partially covered with rough woods, now of the cork-tree, and now of the great Spanish chestnut, and frequently intersected by the beds of mountain torrents. The sun shone, the wind rustled joyously, and we had advanced some miles, and the city had already shrunk into an inconsiderable knoll upon the plain behind us, before my attention began to be diverted to the companion of my drive. To the eye, he seemed but a diminutive, loutish, well-made country lad, such as the doctor had described mighty quick and active, but devoid of any culture. And this first impression was, with most observers, final. What began to strike me was his familiar, chattering talk, so strangely inconsistent with the terms on which I was to be received, and partly from his imperfect enunciation, partly from the sprightly incoherence of the matter, so very difficult to follow clearly without an effort of the mind. It is true I had before talked with persons of a similar mental constitution, persons who seemed to live, as he did, by the senses, taken and possessed by the visual object of the moment, and unable to discharge their minds of that impression. He seemed to me, as I sat, distantly giving ear, a kind of conversation proper to drivers, who pass much of their time in a great vacancy of the intellect and threading the sights of a familiar country. But this was not the case of Felipe. By his own account he was a home-keeper. "'I wish I was there now,' he said. And then spying a tree by the wayside, he broke off to tell me that he had once seen a crow among its branches. "'A crow?' I repeated, struck by the ineptitude of the remark, and thinking I had heard imperfectly. But by this time he was already filled with a new idea, hearkening with a rapt intentness, his head on one side, his face puckered, and he struck me rudely to make me hold my peace. Then he smiled and shook his head. "'What did you hear?' I asked. "'Oh, it is all right,' he said, and began encouraging his mule with cries that echoed unhumanly up the mountain walls. I looked at him more closely. He was superlatively well built, light and lithe and strong. He was well featured. His yellow eyes were very large, though perhaps not very expressive. Take him altogether, he was a pleasant-looking lad, and I had no fault to find with him, beyond that he was of a dusky hue, and inclined to hairiness, two characteristics that I disliked. It was his mind that puzzled, and yet attracted me. The doctor's phrase, an innocent, came back to me, and I was wondering if that were, after all, the true description when the road began to go down into the narrow and naked chasm of a torrent. The waters thundered tumultuously in the bottom, and the ravine was filled full of the sound, the thin spray, and the claps of wind that accompanied their descent. The scene was certainly impressive, but the road was in that part very securely walled in. The mule went steadily forward, and I was astonished to perceive the paleness of terror in the face of my companion. The voice of that wild river was inconstant, now sinking lower as if in weariness, now doubling its hoarse tones. Momentary freshets seemed to swell its volume, sweeping down the gorge, raving and booming against the barrier walls, and I observed it was at each of these ascensions to the clamour that my driver more particularly winced and blanched. Some thoughts of Scottish superstition and the river Kelpie passed across my mind. I wondered if perchance the like were prevalent in that part of Spain and, turning to Felipe, sought to draw him out. "'What is the matter?' I asked. "'Oh, I am afraid,' he replied. "'Of what are you afraid?' I returned, 
This seems one of the safest places on this very dangerous road. It makes a noise, he said, with a simplicity of awe that set my doubts at rest. The lad was but a child in intellect. His mind was like his body, active and swift, but stunted in development. And I began from that time forth to regard him with a measure of pity, and to listen at first with indulgence, and at last even with pleasure, to his disjointed babble. By about four in the afternoon we had crossed the summit of the mountain line, said farewell to the western sunshine, and began to go down upon the other side, skirting the edge of many ravines and moving through the shadow of dusky woods. There rose upon all sides the voice of falling water, not condensed and formidable as in the gorge of the river, but scattered and sounding gaily and musically from glen to glen. Here, too, the spirits of my driver mended, and he began to sing aloud in a falsetto voice, and with a singular bluntness of musical perception, never true either to melody or key, but wandering at will, and yet somehow with an effect that was natural and pleasing, like that of the birds. As the dusk increased, I fell more and more under the spell of this artless warbling, listening and waiting for some articulate air, and still disappointed. And when at last I asked him what it was he sang, Oh, cried he, I'm just singing. Above all, I was taken with a trick he had of unweariedly repeating the same note at little intervals. It was not so monotonous as you would think, or at least not disagreeable, and it seemed to breathe a wonderful contentment with what is, such as we love to fancy, in the attitude of trees, or the quiescence of a pool. Night had fallen dark before we came out upon a plateau, and drew up a little after, before a certain lump of superior blackness, which I could only conjecture to be the residencia. Here my guide, getting down from the cart, hooted and whistled for a long time in vain, until at last an old peasant man came towards us from somewhere in the surrounding dark, carrying a candle in his hand. By the light of this I was able to perceive a great arched doorway of a Moorish character. It was closed by iron-studded gates, in one of the leaves of which Felipe opened a wicket. The peasant carried off the cart to some outbuilding, but my guide and I passed through the wicket, which was closed again behind us, and by the glimmer of the candle, passed through a court, up a stone stair, along a section of an open gallery, and up more stairs again, until we came at last to the door of a great and somewhat bare apartment. This room, which I understood was to be mine, was pierced by three windows, lined with some lustrous wood disposed in panels, and carpeted with the skins of many savage animals. A bright fire burned in the chimney, and shed abroad a changeful flicker. Close up to the blaze there was drawn a table, laid for supper, and in the far end a bed stood ready. I was pleased by these preparations, and said so to Felipe, and he, with the same simplicity of disposition that I had already remarked in him, warmly re-echoed my praises. A fine room, he said, a very fine room. And fire, too. Fire is good. It melts out the pleasure in your bones. And the bed, he continued, carrying over the candle in that direction. See what fine sheets! How soft! How smooth! Smooth! And he passed his hand again and again over their texture, and then laid down his head and rubbed his cheeks among them with a grossness of content that somehow offended me. I took the candle from his hand, for I feared he would set the bed on fire, and walked back to the supper-table, where, perceiving a measure of wine, I poured out a cup and called to him to come and drink of it. He started to his feet at once and ran to me with a strong expression of hope, but when he saw the wine, he visibly shuddered. "'Oh, no,' he said, "'not that. That is for you. I hate it.' "'Very well, senor, said I. "'Then I will drink to your good health, and to the prosperity of your house and family.' Speaking of which, I added, after I had drunk, shall I not have the pleasure of laying my salutations in person at the feet of the Signora, your mother? But at these words, all the childishness passed out of his face, and was succeeded by a look of indescribable cunning and secrecy. He backed away from me at the same time, as though I were an animal about to leap, or some dangerous fellow with a weapon, and when he had got near the door, glowered at me sullenly with contracted pupils. No! he said at last, and the next moment was gone noiselessly out of the room, and I heard his footing die away downstairs as light as rainfall, and silence closed over the house. After I had supped I drew up the table nearer to the bed, and began to prepare for rest, but in the new position of the light I was struck by a picture on the wall. It represented a woman, still young. To judge by her costume and the mellow unity which reigned over the canvas, she had long been dead 
to judge by the vivacity of the attitude, the eyes, and the features, I might have been beholding in a mirror the image of life. Her figure was very slim and strong, and of a just proportion. Red tresses lay like a crown over her brow. Her eyes, of a very golden brown, held mine with a look, and her face, which was perfectly shaped, was yet marred by a cruel, sullen, and sensual expression. Something in both face and figure, something exquisitely intangible, like the echo of an echo, suggested the features and bearing of my guide. And I stood a while, unpleasantly attracted and wondering at the oddity of the resemblance. The common carnal stock of that race, which had been originally designed for such high dames as the one now looking on me from the canvas, had fallen to baser uses, wearing country clothes, sitting on the shaft and holding the reins of a mule-cart, to bring home a lodger. Perhaps an actual link subsisted. Perhaps some scruple of the delicate flesh that was once clothed upon with the satin and brocade of the dead lady, now winced at the rude contact of Felipe's frieze. The first light of the morning shone full upon the portrait, and as I lay awake my eyes continued to dwell upon it with growing complacency. Its beauty crept about my heart insidiously, silencing my scruples one after another. And while I knew that to love such a woman were to sign and seal one's own sentence of degeneration, I still knew that, if she were alive, I should love her. Day after day the double knowledge of her wickedness and of my weakness grew clearer. She came to be the heroine of many day-dreams, in which her eyes led on to, and sufficiently rewarded, crimes. She cast a dark shadow on my fancy, and when I was out in the free air of heaven, taking vigorous exercise and healthily renewing the current of my blood, it was often a glad thought to me that my enchantress was safe in the grave, her wand of beauty broken, her lips closed in silence, her filter spilt. And yet I had a half-lingering terror that she might not be dead after all, but re-arisen in the body of some descendant. Felipe served my meals in my own apartment, and his resemblance to the portrait haunted me. At times it was not. At times, upon some change of attitude or flash of expression, it would leap out upon me like a ghost. It was above all in his ill-tempers that the likeness triumphed. He certainly liked me, he was proud of my notice, which he sought to engage by many simple and childlike devices. He loved to sit close before my fire, talking his broken talk or singing his odd, endless, wordless songs, and sometimes drawing his hand over my clothes, with an affectionate manner of caressing that never failed to cause in me an embarrassment of which I was ashamed. But for all that, he was capable of flashes of causeless anger, and fits of sturdy sullenness. At a word of reproof, I have seen him upset the dish of which I was about to eat, and this not surreptitiously, but with defiance, and similarly at a hint of inquisition. I was not unnaturally curious, being in a strange place and surrounded by strange people, but at the shadow of a question he shrank back, lowering and dangerous. Then it was that, for a fraction of a second, this rough lad might have been the brother of the lady in the frame. But these humours were swift to pass, and the resemblance died along with them. In these first days I saw nothing of any one but Felipe, unless the portrait is to be counted. And since the lad was plainly of weak mind, and had moments of passion, it may be wondered that I bore his dangerous neighbourhood with equanimity. As a matter of fact, it was for some time irksome. But it happened before long that I obtained over him so complete a mastery as set my disquietude at rest. It fell in this way. He was by nature slothful, and much of a vagabond, and yet he kept by the house, and not only waited upon my wants, but laboured every day in the garden or small farm to the south of the residencia. Here he would be joined by the peasant whom I had seen on the night of my arrival, and who dwelt at the far end of the enclosure, about half a mile away, in a rude outhouse. But it was plain to me, that of these two, it was Felipe who did most and though I would sometimes see him throw down his spade and go to sleep among the very plants he had been digging, his constancy and energy were admirable in themselves, and still more so since I was well assured they were foreign to his disposition, and the fruit of an ungrateful effort. But while I admired, I wondered what had called forth in a lad so shuttle-witted this enduring sense of duty. How was it sustained, I asked myself, and to what length did it prevail over his instincts? The priest was possibly his inspirer, but the priest came one day to the residencia. I saw him both come and go, after an interval of close upon an hour, from a knoll where I was sketching, 
and all that time Felipe continued to labour undisturbed in the garden. At last, in a very unworthy spirit, I determined to debauch the lad from his good resolutions, and waylaying him at the gate, easily persuaded him to join me in a ramble. It was a fine day, and the woods to which I led him were green and pleasant and sweet-smelling, and alive with the hum of insects. Here he discovered himself in a fresh character, mounting up to heights of gaiety that abashed me, and displaying an energy and grace of movement that delighted the eye. He leapt, he ran round me in mere glee, he would stop and look and listen, and seem to drink in the world like a cordial, and then he would suddenly spring into a tree with one bound, and hang and gamble there like one at home. Little as he said to me, and that of not much import, I have rarely enjoyed more stirring company. The sight of his delight was a continual feast. The speed and accuracy of his movements pleased me to the heart, and I might have been so thoughtlessly unkind as to make a habit of these wants, had not chance prepared a very rude conclusion to my pleasure. By some swiftness or dexterity the lad captured a squirrel in a tree-top. He was then some way ahead of me, but I saw him drop to the ground and crouch there, crying aloud for pleasure like a child. The sound stirred my sympathies, it was so fresh and innocent, but as I bettered my pace to draw near, the cry of the squirrel knocked upon my heart. I have heard and seen much of the cruelty of lads, and above all of peasants, but what I now beheld struck me into a passion of anger. I thrust the fellow aside, plucked the poor brute out of his hands, and with swift mercy killed it. Then I turned upon the torturer, spoke to him long out of the heat of my indignation, calling him names at which he seemed to wither, and at length, pointing toward the residencia, bade him be gone and leave me, for I chose to walk with men, not with vermin. He fell upon his knees, and the words coming to him with more cleanness than usual, poured out a stream of the most touching supplications, begging me in mercy to forgive him, to forget what he had done, to look to the future. Oh, I try so hard, he said. Oh, Commandante, bear with Felipe this once. He will never be a brute again. Thereupon, much more affected than I cared to show, I suffered myself to be persuaded, and at last shook hands with him and made it up. But the squirrel, by way of penance, I made him bury, speaking of the poor thing's beauty, telling him what pains it had suffered, and how base a thing was the abuse of strength. See, Felipe, said I, you are strong indeed, but in my hands you are as helpless as that poor thing of the trees. Give me your hand in mine, you cannot remove it. Now suppose that I were cruel like you, and took a pleasure in pain. I only tighten my hold, and see how you suffer." He screamed aloud, his face stricken ashy and dotted with needle-points of sweat, and when I set him free, he fell to the earth and nursed his hand and moaned over it like a baby. But he took the lesson in good part, and whether from that, or from what I had said to him, or the higher notion he now had of my bodily strength, his original affection was changed into a dog-like, adoring fidelity. End of Part One Part Two of Olalla. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Olalla by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part Two. Meanwhile, I gained rapidly in health. The residencia stood on the crown of a stony plateau. On every side, the mountains hemmed it about. Only from the roof, where was a bartizan, there might be seen between two peaks a small segment of plain, blue with extreme distance. The air in these altitudes moved freely and largely. Great clouds congregated there, and were broken up by the wind and left in tatters on the hilltops. A hoarse and yet faint rumbling of torrents rose from all round, and one could there study all the ruder and more ancient characters of nature in something of their pristine force. I delighted from the first in the vigorous scenery and changeful weather, nor less in the antique and dilapidated mansion where I dwelt. This was a large oblong, flanked at two opposite corners by bastion-like projections, one of which commanded the door, while both were loopholed for musketry. The lower story was, besides, naked of windows, so that the building, if garrisoned, could not be carried without artillery. It enclosed an open court, planted with pomegranate trees. 
From this a broad flight of marble stairs ascended to an open gallery, running all round, and resting, towards the court, on slender pillars. Thence again, several enclosed stairs led to the upper stories of the house, which were thus broken up into distinct divisions. The windows, both within and without, were closely shuttered. Some of the stonework in the upper parts had fallen. The roof in one place had been wrecked in one of the flurries of wind which were common in these mountains. And the whole house, in the strong, beating sunlight, and standing out above a grove of stunted cork-trees, thickly laden and discoloured with dust, looked like the sleeping palace of the legend. The court, in particular, seemed the very home of slumber. A hoarse cooing of doves haunted about the eaves. The winds were excluded, but when they blew outside, the mountain dust fell here as thick as rain, and veiled the red bloom of the pomegranates. Shuttered windows and the closed doors of numerous cellars, and the vacant arches of the gallery, enclosed it, and all day long the sun made broken profiles on the four sides, and paraded the shadow of the pillars on the gallery floor. At the ground level there was, however, a certain pillared recess, which bore the marks of human habitation. Though it was open in front upon the court, it was yet provided with a chimney, where a wood-fire would be always prettily blazing, and the tile-floor was littered with the skins of animals. It was in this place that I first saw my hostess. She had drawn one of the skins forward, and sat in the sun, leaning against a pillar. It was her dress that struck me first of all, for it was rich and brightly coloured, and shone out in that dusty courtyard with something of the same relief as the flowers of the pomegranates. At a second look, it was her beauty of person that took hold of me. As she sat back, watching me, I thought, though with invisible eyes, and wearing at the same time an expression of almost imbecile good humour and contentment, she showed a perfectness of feature, and a quiet nobility of attitude that were beyond a statue's. I took off my hat to her in passing, and her face puckered with suspicion as swiftly and lightly as a pool ruffles in the breeze, but she paid no heed to my courtesy. I went forth on my customary walk a trifle daunted, her idol-like impassivity haunting me. And when I returned, although she was still in much the same posture, I was half surprised to see that she had moved as far as the next pillar, following the sunshine. This time, however, she addressed me with some trivial salutation, civilly enough conceived, and uttered in the same deep-chested and yet indistinct and lisping tones that had already baffled the utmost niceness of my hearing from her son. I answered rather at a venture, for not only did I fail to take her meaning with precision, but the sudden disclosure of her eyes disturbed me. They were unusually large, the iris golden like Felipe's, but the pupil at that moment so distended, that they seemed almost black, and what affected me was not so much their size, what was perhaps its consequence, the singular insignificance of their regard. A look more blankly stupid I have never met. My eyes dropped before it even as I spoke, and I went on my way upstairs to my own room, at once baffled and embarrassed. Yet when I came there and saw the face of the portrait, I was again reminded of the miracle of family descent. My hostess was, indeed, both older and fuller in person, her eyes were of a different colour. Her face, besides, was not only free from the ill significance that offended and attracted me in the painting, it was devoid of either good or bad a moral blank, expressing literally naught. And yet there was a likeness, not so much speaking as imminent, not so much in any particular feature as upon the whole. It should seem, I thought, as if when the master set his signature to that grave canvas, he had not only caught the image of one smiling and false-eyed woman, but stamped the essential quality of a race. From that day forth, whether I came or went, I was sure to find the Signora seated in the sun against a pillar, or stretched on a rug before the fire. Only at times she would shift her station to the top round of the stone staircase, where she lay with the same nonchalance right across my path. In all these days I never knew her to display the least spark of energy beyond what she expended in brushing and re-brushing her copious copper-coloured hair or in lisping out, in the rich and broken hoarseness of her voice, her customary idle salutations to myself. These, I think, were her two chief pleasures, beyond that of mere quiescence. She seemed always proud of her remarks, as though they had been witticisms, and indeed, though they were empty enough, like the conversation of many respectable persons, and turned on a very narrow range of subjects, they were never meaningless or incoherent. Nay, 
they had a certain beauty of their own, breathing, as they did, of her entire contentment. Now she would speak of the warmth, in which, like her son, she greatly delighted, now of the flowers of the pomegranate trees, and now of the white doves and long-winged swallows that fanned the air of the court. The birds excited her, as they raked the eaves in their swift flight, or skimmed sidelong past her with a rush of wind, she would sometimes stir, and sit up a little, and seem to waken from her doze of satisfaction. But for the rest of her days she lay luxuriously folded on herself, and sunk in sloth and pleasure. Her invincible content at first annoyed me, but I came gradually to find repose in the spectacle, until at last it grew to be my habit to sit down beside her four times in the day, both coming and going and to talk with her sleepily, I scarce knew of what. I had come to like her dull, almost animal neighbourhood. Her beauty and her stupidity soothed and amused me. I began to find a kind of transcendental good sense in her remarks, and her unfathomable good nature moved me to admiration and envy. The liking was returned. She enjoyed my presence half unconsciously, as a man in deep meditation may enjoy the babbling of a brook. I can scarce say she brightened when I came, for satisfaction was written on her face eternally, as on some foolish statues. But I was made conscious of her pleasure by some more intimate communication than the sight. And one day, as I sat within reach of her on the marble step, she suddenly shot forth one of her hands, and patted mine. The thing was done, and she was back in her accustomed attitude, before my mind had received intelligence of the caress and when I turned to look her in the face, I could perceive no answerable sentiment. It was plain she attached no moment to the act, and I blamed myself for my own more uneasy consciousness. The sight, and, if I may so call it, the acquaintance of the mother, confirmed the view I had already taken of the son. The family blood had been impoverished, perhaps by long inbreeding, which I knew to be a common error among the proud and the exclusive. No decline, indeed, was to be traced in the body, which had been handed down unimpaired in shapeliness and strength, and the faces of to-day were struck as sharply from the mint as the face of two centuries ago that smiled upon me from the portrait. But the intelligence, that more precious heirloom, was degenerate, the treasure of ancestral memory ran low, and it had required the potent plebeian crossing of a muleteer or mountain contrabandista to raise, what approached hebetude in the mother, into the active oddity of the son. Yet of the two it was the mother I preferred. Of Felipe, vengeful and placable, full of starts and shyings, inconstant as a hare, I could even conceive as a creature possibly noxious. Of the mother I had no thoughts but those of kindness and indeed, as spectators are apt ignorantly to take sides, I grew something of a partisan in the enmity which I perceived to smoulder between them. True, it seemed mostly on the mother's part. She would sometimes draw in her breath as he came near, and the pupils of her vacant eyes would contract as if with horror or fear. Her emotions, such as they were, were much upon the surface and readily shared, and this latent repulsion occupied my mind, and kept me wondering on what grounds it rested, and whether the sun was certainly in fault. I had been about ten days in the residencia, when there sprang up a high and harsh wind, carrying clouds of dust. It came out of malarious lowlands, and over several snowy sierras. The nerves of those on whom it blew were strung, and jangled. Their eyes smarted with the dust, their legs ached under the burden of their body, and the touch of one hand upon another grew to be odious. The wind, besides, came down the gullies of the hills, and stormed about the house with a great hollow buzzing and whistling that was wearisome to the ear, and dismally depressing to the mind. It did not so much blow in gusts as with the steady sweep of a waterfall, so that there was no remission of discomfort while it blew. But higher upon the mountain, it was probably of a more variable strength, with accesses of fury, for there came down at times a far-off wailing, infinitely grievous to hear, and at times, on one of the high shelves or terraces, there would start up, and then disperse, a tower of dust, like the smoke of an explosion. I no sooner awoke in bed than I was conscious of the nervous tension and depression of the weather, and the effect grew stronger as the day proceeded. It was in vain that I resisted, in vain that I set forth upon my customary morning's walk. The irrational, unchanging fury of the storm had soon beat down my strength, and wrecked my temper, and I returned to the residencia, glowing with dry heat, and foul and gritty with dust. 
the court had a forlorn appearance, now and then a glimmer of sun fled over it, now and then the wind swooped down upon the pomegranates, and scattered the blossoms, and set the window-shutters clapping upon the wall. In the recess the signora was pacing to and fro, with a flushed countenance and bright eyes. I thought, too, she was speaking to herself, like one in anger. But when I addressed her with my customary salutation, she only replied by a sharp gesture, and continued her walk. The weather had distempered even this impassive creature, and as I went on upstairs I was the less ashamed of my own discomposure. All day the wind continued, and I sat in my room and made a feint of reading, or walked up and down, and listened to the riot overhead. Night fell, and I had not so much as a candle. I began to long for some society, and stole down to the court. It was now plunged in the blue of the first darkness, but the recess was redly lighted by the fire. The wood had been piled high, and was crowned by a shock of flames, which the draught of the chimney brandished to and fro. In this strong and shaken brightness the Signora continued pacing from wall to wall, with disconnected gestures, clasping her hands, stretching forth her arms, throwing back her head as an appeal to heaven. In these disordered movements the beauty and grace of the woman showed more clearly, but there was a light in her eye that struck on me unpleasantly, and when I had looked on a while in silence and seemingly unobserved, I turned tail as I had come, and groped my way back again to my own chamber. By the time Felipe brought my supper and lights, my nerve was utterly gone, and had the lad been such as I was used to seeing him, I should have kept him, even by force had that been necessary, to take off the edge from my distasteful solitude. But on Felipe also the wind had exercised its influence. He had been feverish all day. Now that the night had come, he was fallen into a low and tremulous humour that reacted on my own. The sight of his scared face, his starts and pallors and sudden hearkenings, unstrung me, and when he dropped and broke a dish, I fairly leapt out of my seat. "'I think we are all mad to-day,' said I, affecting to laugh. "'It is the black wind,' he replied dolefully. "'You feel as if you must do something, and you don't know what it is.' I noted the aptness of the description. But, indeed, Felipe had sometimes a strange felicity in rendering into words the sensations of the body. "'And your mother, too,' said I. "'She seems to feel this weather much. Do you not fear she may be unwell?' He stared at me a little, and then said, "'No,' almost defiantly, and the next moment, carrying his hand to his brow, cried out lamentably on the wind and the noise that made his head go round like a mill-wheel. "'Who can be well?' he cried and indeed I could only echo his question, for I was disturbed enough myself. I went to bed early, wearied with day-long restlessness, but the poisonous nature of the wind, and its ungodly and unintermittent uproar, would not suffer me to sleep. I lay there and tossed, my nerves and senses on the stretch. At times I would doze, dream horribly, and wake again, and these snatches of oblivion confused me as to time but it must have been late on in the night, when I was suddenly startled by an outbreak of pitiable and hateful cries. I leapt from my bed, supposing I had dreamed, but the cries still continued to fill the house, cries of pain, I thought, but certainly of rage also, and so savage and discordant that they shocked the heart. It was no illusion. Some living thing, some lunatic or wild animal, was being foully tortured. The thought of Felipe and the squirrel flashed into my mind, and I ran to the door, but it had been locked from the outside, and I might shake it as I pleased. I was a fast prisoner. Still the cries continued. Now they would dwindle down into a moaning that seemed to be articulate, and at these times I made sure they must be human, and again they would break forth and fill the house with ravings worthy of hell. I stood at the door and gave ear to them, till at last they died away. Long after that I still lingered and still continued to hear them mingle in fancy with the storming of the wind and when at last I crept to my bed, it was with a deadly sickness, and a blackness of horror on my heart. It was little wonder if I slept no more. Why had I been locked in? What had passed? Who was the author of these indescribable and shocking cries? A human being? It was inconceivable. A beast? The cries were scarce quite bestial, and what animal, short of a lion or tiger, could thus shake the solid walls of the residencia? And while I was thus turning over the elements of the mystery, it came into my mind that I had not yet set eyes upon the daughter of the house. 
What was more probable than that the daughter of the signora, and the sister of Felipe, should be herself insane? Or what more likely than that these ignorant and half-witted people should seek to manage an afflicted kinswoman by violence? Here was a solution. And yet, when I called to mind the cries, which I never did without a shuddering chill, it seemed altogether insufficient. Not even cruelty could wring such cries from madness. But of one thing I was sure. I could not live in a house where such a thing was half conceivable, and not probe the matter home, and, if necessary, interfere. The next day came, the wind had blown itself out, and there was nothing to remind me of the business of the night. Felipe came to my bedside with obvious cheerfulness. As I passed through the court, the signora was sunning herself with her accustomed immobility, and when I issued from the gateway, I found the whole face of nature austerely smiling, the heavens of a cold blue, and sown with great cloud islands, and the mountain sides mapped forth into provinces of light and shadow. A short walk restored me to myself, and renewed within me the resolve to plumb this mystery. And when from the vantage of my knoll I had seen Felipe pass forth to his labours in the garden, I returned at once to the residencia to put my design in practice. The signora appeared plunged in slumber. I stood a while and marked her, but she did not stir. Even if my design were indiscreet, I had little to fear from such a guardian. And turning away, I mounted to the gallery and began my exploration of the house. All morning I went from one door to another, and entered spacious and faded chambers, some rudely shuttered, some receiving their full charge of daylight, all empty and unhomely. It was a rich house, on which time had breathed his tarnish, and dust had scattered disillusion. The spider swung there, the bloated tarantula scampered on the cornices, ants had their crowded highways on the floors of halls of audience. The big and foul fly that lives on carrion, and is often the messenger of death, had set up his nest in the rotten woodwork, and buzzed heavily about the rooms. Here and there a stool or two, a couch, a bed, or a great carved chair remained behind, like islets on the bare floors, to testify of man's bygone habitation, and everywhere the walls were set with the portraits of the dead. I could judge by these decaying effigies, in the house of what a great and what a handsome race I was then wandering. Many of the men wore orders on their breasts, and had the port of noble offices. The women were all richly attired, the canvases most of them by famous hands. But it was not so much these evidences of greatness that took hold upon my mind, even contrasted as they were, with the present depopulation and decay of that great house. It was rather the parable of family life that I read in this succession of fair faces and shapely bodies. Never before had I so realized the miracle of the continued race, the creation and recreation, the weaving and changing and handing down of fleshly elements. That a child should be born of its mother, that it should grow and clothe itself, we know not how, with humanity, and put on inherited looks, and turn its head with the manner of one ascendant, and offer its hand with the gesture of another, are wonders dulled for us by repetition. But in the singular unity of look, in the common features and common bearing, of all these painted generations on the walls of the residencia, the miracle started out and looked me in the face. And an ancient mirror falling opportunely in my way, I stood and read my own features a long while, tracing out on either hand the filaments of descent, and the bonds that knit me with my family. At last, in the course of these investigations, I opened the door of a chamber that bore the marks of habitation. It was of large proportions, and faced to the north, where the mountains were most wildly figured. The embers of a fire smouldered and smoked upon the hearth, to which a chair had been drawn close. And yet the aspect of the chamber was ascetic to the degree of sternness. The chair was uncushioned, the floor and walls were naked and beyond the books which lay here and there in some confusion, there was no instrument of either work or pleasure. The sight of books in the house of such a family exceedingly amazed me, and I began with a great hurry, and in a momentary fear of interruption, to go from one to another and hastily inspect their character. They were of all sorts, devotional, historical, and scientific, but mostly of a great age, and in the Latin tongue. Some I could see to bear the marks of constant study, Others had been torn across and tossed aside as if in petulance or disapproval. Lastly, as I cruised about that empty chamber, I espied some papers written upon with pencil on a table near the window. 
an unthinking curiosity led me to take one up. It bore a copy of verses, very roughly metred in the original Spanish, and which I may render somewhat thus. Pleasure approached with pain and shame, grief with a wreath of lilies came. Pleasure showed the lovely sun, Jesu dear, how sweet it shone! Grief with her worn hand pointed on, Jesu dear, to thee. Shame and confusion at once fell upon me, and laying down the paper, I beat an immediate retreat from the apartment. Neither Felipe nor his mother could have read the books, nor written these rough but feeling verses. It was plain I had stumbled with sacrilegious feet into the room of the daughter of the house. God knows my own heart most sharply punished me for my indiscretion. The thought that I had thus secretly pushed my way into the confidence of a girl so strangely situated, and the fear that she might somehow come to hear of it, oppressed me like guilt. I blamed myself besides for my suspicions of the night before, wondered that I ever should have attributed those shocking cries to one of whom I now conceived as of a saint, spectral of mien, wasted with maceration, bound up in the practices of a mechanical devotion, and dwelling in a great isolation of soul with her incongruous relatives. And as I leaned on the balustrade of the gallery, and looked down into the bright clothes of pomegranates, and at the gaily dressed and somnolent woman, who just then stretched herself and delicately licked her lips, as in the very sensuality of sloth, my mind swiftly compared the scene with the cold chamber looking northward on the mountains, where the daughter dwelt. That same afternoon, as I sat upon my knoll, I saw the padre enter the gates of the residencia. The revelation of the daughter's character had struck home to my fancy, and almost blotted out the horrors of the night before. But at sight of this worthy man the memory revived. I descended, then, from the knoll, and making a circuit among the woods, posted myself by the wayside to await his passage. As soon as he appeared I stepped forth and introduced myself as the lodger of the residencia. He had a very strong, honest countenance, on which it was easy to read the mingled emotions with which he regarded me, as a foreigner, a heretic, and yet one who had been wounded for the good cause. Of the family at the residencia he spoke with reserve, and yet with respect. I mentioned that I had not yet seen the daughter, whereupon he remarked that that was as it should be, and looked at me a little askance. Lastly I plucked up the courage to refer to the cries that had disturbed me in the night. He heard me out in silence, and then stopped and partly turned about, as though to mark beyond doubt that he was dismissing me. "'Do you take tobacco powder?' said he, offering his snuff-box. And then, when I had refused, "'I am an old man,' he added, "'and I may be allowed to remind you that you are a guest.' "'I have, then, your authority,' I returned, firmly enough, although I flushed at the implied reproof, "'to let things take their course, and not to interfere.' He said, "'Yes.' and with a somewhat uneasy salute turned and left me where I was. But he had done two things. He had set my conscience at rest, and he had awakened my delicacy. I made a great effort once more dismissed the recollections of the night, and fell once more to brooding on my saintly poetess. At the same time I could not quite forget that I had been locked in, and that night when Felipe brought me my supper I attacked him warily on both points of interest. "'I never see your sister.' said I, casually. "'Oh, no,' said he. "'She is a good, good girl.' And his mind instantly veered to something else. "'Your sister is pious, I suppose?' I asked in the next pause. "'Oh!' he cried, joining his hands with extreme fervour. "'A saint! It is she that keeps me up.' "'You are fortunate,' said I. "'For the most of us, I am afraid, and myself among the number, are better at going down.' Senor, said Felipe earnestly, I would not say that. You should not tempt your angel. If one goes down, where is he to stop? Why, Felipe, said I, I had no guess you were a preacher, and I may say a good one. But I suppose that is your sister's doing. He nodded at me with round eyes. Well, then, I continued, she has doubtless reproved you for your sin of cruelty. Twelve times, he cried, for this was the phrase by which the odd creature expressed the sense of frequency. And I told her you had done so. I remembered that," he added proudly, and she was pleased. Then Felipe, said I, what were those cries that I heard last night? For surely they were cries of some creature in suffering. The wind, returned Felipe, looking in the fire. I took his hand in mine, at which, thinking it to be a caress, he smiled with a brightness of pleasure that came near disarming my resolve. But I trod the weakness down. The wind, I repeated. And yet I think it was this hand, 
holding it up, that had first locked me in. The lad shook visibly, but answered never a word. Well, said I, I am a stranger and a guest. It is not my part either to meddle or to judge in your affairs. In these you shall take your sister's counsel, which I cannot doubt to be excellent. But in so far as concerns my own, I will be no man's prisoner, and I demand that key. Half an hour later my door was suddenly thrown open, and the key tossed ringing on the floor. End of Part 2 Part Three of Olalla. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Olalla by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part Three. A day or two after, I came in from a walk a little before the point of noon. The Senora was lying lapped in slumber on the threshold of the recess. The pigeons dozed below the eaves like snowdrifts. The house was under a deep spell of noontide quiet and only a wandering and gentle wind from the mountains stole round the galleries, rustled among the pomegranates, and pleasantly stirred the shadows. Something in the stillness moved me to imitation, and I went very lightly across the court, and up the marble staircase. My foot was on the topmost round, when a door opened, and I found myself face to face with Olalla. Surprise transfixed me. Her loveliness struck to my heart, she glowed in the deep shadow of the gallery, a gem of colour. Her eyes took hold upon mine and clung there, and bound us together like the joining of hands, and the moments we thus stood face to face, drinking each other in, were sacramental and the wedding of souls. I know not how long it was before I awoke out of a deep trance, and hastily bowing, passed on into the upper stair. She did not move, but followed me with her great, thirsting eyes, and as I passed out of sight, it seemed to me as if she paled and faded. In my own room I opened the window and looked out, and could not think what change had come upon that austere field of mountains, that it should thus sing and shine under the lofty heaven. I had seen her, O oh, Lalla! And the stone crags answered, O oh, Lalla! and the dumb, unfathomable azure answered, O oh, Lalla! The pale saint of my dreams had vanished for ever, and in her place I beheld this maiden on whom God had lavished the richest colours and the most exuberant energies of life, whom he had made active as a deer, slender as a reed, and in whose great eyes he had lighted the torches of the soul. The thrill of her young life, strung like a wild animal's, had entered into me. The force of soul that had looked out from her eyes and conquered mine, mantled about my heart and sprang to my lips in singing. She passed through my veins. She was one with me. I will not say that this enthusiasm declined. Rather my soul held out in its ecstasy as in a strong castle, and was there besieged by cold and sorrowful considerations. I could not doubt but that I loved her at first sight, and already with a quivering ardour that was strange to my experience. What, then, was to follow? She was the child of an afflicted house, the Senora's daughter, the sister of Felipe. She bore it even in her beauty. She had the lightness and swiftness of the one, swift as an arrow, light as dew. Like the other, she shone in the pale background of the world, with the brilliancy of flowers. I could not call by the name of brother that half-witted lad, nor by the name of mother that immovable and lovely thing of flesh, whose silly eyes and perpetual simper now recurred to my mind like something hateful. And if I could not marry, what then? She was helplessly unprotected. Her eyes in that single and long glance which had been all our intercourse had confessed a weakness equal to my own. But in my heart I knew her for the student of the cold northern chamber, and the writer of the sorrowful lines, and this was a knowledge to disarm a brute. To flee was more than I could find courage for, but I registered a vow of unsleeping circumspection. As I turned from the window, my eyes alighted on the portrait. It had fallen dead like a candle after sunrise. It followed me with eyes of paint. I knew it to be like— and marvelled at the tenacity of type in that declining race, but the likeness was swallowed up in difference. 
I remembered how it had seemed to me a thing unapproachable in the life, a creature rather of the painter's craft than of the modesty of nature, and I marvelled at the thought, and exulted in the image of Olalla. Beauty I had seen before, and not been charmed, and I had been often drawn to women who were not beautiful except to me. But in Olalla, all that I desired, and had not dared to imagine, was united. I did not see her the next day, and my heart ached and my eyes longed for her, as men long for morning. But the day after, when I returned about my usual hour, she was once more on the gallery, and our looks once more met and embraced. I would have spoken, I would have drawn near to her, but strongly as she plucked at my heart, drawing me like a magnet, something yet more imperious withheld me, and I could only bow and pass by, and she, leaving my salutation unanswered, only followed me with her noble eyes. I had now her image by rote, and as I conned the traits in memory, it seemed as if I read her very heart. She was dressed with something of her mother's coquetry, and love of positive colour. Her robe, which I know she must have made with her own hands, clung about her with a cunning grace. After the fashion of that country, besides, her bodice stood open in the middle, in a long slit, and here, in spite of the poverty of the house, a gold coin, hanging by a ribbon, lay on her brown bosom. These were proofs, had any been needed, of her inborn delight in life and her own loveliness. On the other hand, in her eyes that hung upon mine, I could read depth beyond depth of passion and sadness, lights of poetry and hope, blacknesses of despair, and thoughts that were above the earth. It was a lovely body, but the inmate, the soul, was more than worthy of that lodging. Should I leave this incomparable flower to wither unseen on these rough mountains? Should I despise the great gift offered me in the eloquent silence of her eyes? Here was a soul immured. Should I not burst its prison? All side considerations fell off from me. Were she the child of Herod, I swore I should make her mine, and that very evening I set myself, with a mingled sense of treachery and disgrace, to captivate the brother. Perhaps I read him with more favourable eyes. Perhaps the thought of his sister always summoned up the better qualities of that imperfect soul. But he had never seemed to me so amiable and his very likeness to Olalla, while it annoyed, yet softened me. A third day passed in vain, an empty desert of hours. I would not lose a chance, and loitered all afternoon in the court, where, to give myself a countenance, I spoke more than usual with the signora. God knows it was with a most tender and sincere interest that I now studied her, and even as for Felipe, so now for the mother, I was conscious of a growing warmth of toleration. And yet I wondered. Even while I spoke with her, she would doze off into a little sleep, and presently awake again without embarrassment. And this composure staggered me. And again, as I marked her make infinitesimal changes in her posture, savouring and lingering on the bodily pleasure of the movement, I was driven to wonder at this depth of passive sensuality. She lived in her body, and her consciousness was all sunk into and disseminated through her members, where it luxuriously dwelt. Lastly, I could not grow accustomed to her eyes. Each time she turned on me these great, beautiful, and meaningless orbs, wide open to the day, but closed against human inquiry, each time I had occasion to observe the lively changes of her pupils, which expanded and contracted in a breath, I know not what it was came over me. I can find no name for the mingled feeling of disappointment, annoyance, and distaste that jarred along my nerves. I tried her on a variety of subjects, equally in vain, and at last led the talk to her daughter. But even there she proved indifferent, said she was pretty, which, as with children, was her highest word of commendation, but was plainly incapable of any higher thought, and when I remarked that Olalla seemed silent, merely yawned in my face, and replied that speech was of no great use when you had nothing to say. People speak much, very much she added, looking at me with expanded pupils, and then again yawned, and again showed me a mouth that was as dainty as a toy. This time I took the hint, and leaving her to her repose, went up into my own chamber to sit by the open window, looking on the hills and not beholding them, sunk in lustrous and deep dreams, and hearkening in fancy to the note of a voice that I had never heard. I awoke on the fifth morning with a brightness of anticipation that seemed to challenge fate. I was sure of myself, 
light of heart and foot, and resolve to put my love incontinently to the touch of knowledge. I should lie no longer under the bonds of silence, a dumb thing, living by the eye only, like the love of beasts, but should now put on the spirit, and enter upon the joys of the complete human intimacy. I thought of it with wild hopes, like a voyager to El Dorado, into that unknown and lovely country of her soul I no longer trembled to adventure. Yet when I did indeed encounter her, the same force of passion descended on me, and at once submerged my mind. Speech seemed to drop away from me like a childish habit, and I but drew near to her as the giddy man draws near to the margin of a gulf. She drew back from me a little as I came, but her eyes did not waver from mine, and these lured me forward. At last, when I was already within reach of her, I stopped. Words were denied me. If I advanced, I could but clasp her to my heart in silence, and all that was sane in me, all that was still unconquered, revolted against the thought of such an accost. So we stood for a second, all our life in our eyes, exchanging salvos of attraction and yet each resisting. And then, with a great effort of the will, and conscious at the same time of a sudden bitterness of disappointment, I turned, and went away in the same silence. What power lay upon me that I could not speak? And she, why was she also silent? Why did she draw away before me dumbly, with fascinated eyes? Was this love? Or was it a mere brute attraction, mindless and inevitable, like that of the magnet for the steel? We had never spoken, we were wholly strangers, and yet an influence, strong as the grasp of a giant, swept us silently together. On my side it filled me with impatience, and yet I was sure that she was worthy. I had seen her books, read her verses, and thus, in a sense, divined the soul of my mistress. But on her side it struck me almost cold. Of me she knew nothing but my bodily favour. She was drawn to me as stones fall to the earth. The laws that rule the earth conducted her, unconsenting to my arms. And I drew back at the thought of such a bridal, and began to be jealous for myself. It was not thus that I desired to be loved, and then I began to fall into a great pity for the girl herself. I thought how sharp must be her mortification, that she, the student, the recluse, Felipe's saintly monitress, should have thus confessed an overweening weakness for a man with whom she had never exchanged a word. And at the coming of pity, all other thoughts were swallowed up, and I longed only to find and console and reassure her, to tell her how wholly her love was returned on my side, and how her choice, even if blindly made, was not unworthy. The next day it was glorious weather, depth upon depth of blue over canopy the mountains. The sun shone wide, and the wind in the trees and the many falling torrents in the mountains filled the air with delicate and haunting music. Yet I was prostrated with sadness. My heart wept for the sight of Olalla, as a child weeps for its mother. I sat down on a boulder on the verge of the low cliffs that bound the plateau to the north. Thence I looked down into the wooded valley of a stream where no foot came. In the mood I was in, it was even touching to behold the place untenanted. It lacked Olalla, and I thought of the delight and glory of a life passed wholly with her, in that strong air and among these rugged and lovely surroundings, at first with a whimpering sentiment, and then again with such a fiery joy, that I seemed to grow in strength and stature, like a Samson. And then suddenly I was aware of Olalla drawing near. She appeared out of a grove of cork-trees, and came straight towards me, and I stood up and waited. She seemed in her walking a creature of such life and fire and lightness as amazed me, Yet she came quietly and slowly. Her energy was in the slowness, but for inimitable strength I felt she would have run, she would have flown to me. Still, as she approached, she kept her eyes lowered to the ground, and when she had drawn quite near, it was without one glance that she addressed me. At the first note of her voice I started. It was for this I had been waiting. This was the last test of my love. And, lo! Her enunciation was precise and clear, not lisping and incomplete like that of her family, and the voice, though deeper than usual with women, was still both youthful and womanly. She spoke in a rich chord, golden contralto strains mingled with hoarseness, as the red threads were mingled with the brown among her tresses. 
It was not only a voice that spoke to my heart directly, but it spoke to me of her. And yet her words immediately plunged me back upon despair. "'You will go away,' she said, "'to-day." Her example broke the bonds of my speech. I felt as lightened of a weight, or as if a spell had been dissolved. I knew not in what words I answered, but standing before her on the cliffs, I poured out the whole ardour of my love, telling her that I lived upon the thought of her, slept only to dream of her loveliness, and would gladly forswear my country, my language, and my friends to live for ever by her side. And then, strongly commanding myself, I changed the note. I reassured, I comforted her. I told her I had divined in her a pious and heroic spirit, with which I was worthy to sympathize, and which I longed to share and lighten. Nature, I told her, was the voice of God, which men disobey at peril, and if we were thus humbly drawn together, I, even as by a miracle of love, it must imply a divine fitness in our souls. We must be made, I said, made for one another. We should be mad rebels, I cried out, mad rebels against God, not to obey this instinct. She shook her head. You will go to-day, she repeated, and then with a gesture, and in a sudden sharp note, No, not to-day, she cried, to-morrow. But at this sign of relenting, power came in upon me in a tide. I stretched out my arms and called upon her name, and she leapt to me and clung to me. The hills rocked about us, the earth quailed, a shock as of a blow went through me and left me blind and dizzy. And the next moment she had thrust me back, broken rudely from my arms, and fled with the speed of a deer among the cork-trees. I stood and shouted to the mountains. I turned and went back towards the residencia, waltzing upon air. She sent me away, and yet I had but to call upon her name, and she came to me. These were but the weaknesses of girls, from which even she, the strangest of her sex, was not exempted. Go! Not I, O Lalla! Oh, not I, O Lalla! My O Lalla! A bird sang near by, and in that season birds were rare. It bade me be of good cheer. And once more the whole countenance of nature, from the ponderous and stable mountains down to the lightest leaf and the smallest darting fly in the shadow of the groves, began to stir before me, and to put on the lineaments of life, and wear a face of awful joy. The sunshine struck upon the hills, strong as a hammer on the anvil, and the hills shook. The earth, under that vigorous insulation, yielded up heady scents. The woods smouldered in the blaze. I felt the thrill of travail and delight run through the earth. Something elemental, something rude, violent, and savage, in the love that sang in my heart, was like a key to nature's secrets, and the very stones that rattled under my feet appeared alive and friendly. O oh, Lalla! Her touch had quickened and renewed and strung me up to the old pitch of concert with the rugged earth, to a swelling of the soul that men learn to forget in their polite assemblies. Love burned in me like rage, tenderness waxed fierce. I hated, I adored, I pitied, I revered her with ecstasy. She seemed the link that bound me in with dead things on the one hand, and with our pure and pitying God upon the other, a thing brutal and divine, and akin at once to the innocence and to the unbridled forces of the earth. My head thus reeling, I came into the courtyard of the residencia, and the sight of the mother struck me like a revelation. She sat there, all sloth and contentment, blinking under the strong sunshine, branded with a passive enjoyment, a creature set quite apart, before whom my ardour fell away like a thing ashamed. I stopped a moment, and, commanding such shaken tones as I was able, said a word or two. She looked at me with her unfathomable kindness. Her voice and reply sounded vaguely out of the realm of peace in which she slumbered and there fell on my mind, for the first time, a sense of respect for one so uniformly innocent and happy, and I passed on in a kind of wonder at myself, that I should be so much disquieted. On my table there lay a piece of the same yellow paper I had seen in the north room. It was written on with pencil in the same hand, Olalla's hand, and I picked it up with a sudden sinking of alarm, and read, If you have any kindness for Olalla, if you have any chivalry for a creature sorely wrought, go from here to-day, in pity, in honour, for the sake of him who died, I supplicate that you shall go." I looked at this a while in mere stupidity. 
Then I began to awaken to a weariness and horror of life. The sunshine darkened outside on the bare hills, and I began to shake like a man in terror. The vacancy thus suddenly opened in my life unmanned me like a physical void. It was not my heart, it was not my happiness, it was life itself that was involved. I could not lose her. I said so, and stood repeating it. And then, like one in a dream, I moved to the window, put forth my hand to open the casement, and thrust it through the pane. The blood spurted from my wrist, and with an instantaneous quietude and command of myself, I pressed my thumb on the little leaping fountain, and reflected what to do. In that empty room there was nothing to my purpose. I felt, besides, that I required assistance. There shot into my mind a hope that Olalla herself might be my helper, and I turned and went downstairs, still keeping my thumb upon the wound. There was no sign of either Olalla or Felipe, and I addressed myself to the recess, whither the Signora had now quite drawn back, and sat dozing close before the fire, for no degree of heat appeared too much for her. "'Pardon me,' said I, "'if I disturb you, but I must apply to you for help.' She looked up sleepily, and asked me what it was, and with the very words I thought she drew in her breath, with a widening of the nostrils, and seemed to come suddenly and fully alive. "'I have cut myself,' I said, and rather badly. "'See!' And I held out my two hands, from which the blood was oozing and dripping. Her great eyes opened wide, the pupils shrank into points, a veil seemed to fall from her face, and leave it sharply expressive and yet inscrutable. And as I still stood, marvelling a little at her disturbance, she came swiftly up to me, and stooped and caught me by the hand, and the next moment my hand was at her mouth, and she had bitten me to the bone. The pang of the bite, the sudden spurting of blood, and the monstrous horror of the act, flashed through me all in one, and I beat her back, and she sprang at me again and again, with bestial cries, cries that I recognized, such cries as had awakened me on the night of the high wind. Her strength was like that of madness. Mine was rapidly ebbing with the loss of blood, my mind besides was whirling with the abhorrent strangeness of the onslaught, and I was already forced against the wall when Olalla ran betwixt us, and Felipe, following at a bound, pinned down his mother on the floor. A trance-like weakness fell upon me. I saw, heard, and felt, but I was incapable of movement. I heard the struggle roll to and fro upon the floor, the yells of that catamount ringing up to heaven as she strove to reach me. I felt Olalla clasp me in her arms, her hair falling on my face and, with the strength of a man, raise and half-drag, half-carry me upstairs into my own room, where she cast me down upon the bed. Then I saw her hasten to the door and lock it, and stand an instant listening to the savage cries that shook the residencia. And then, swift and light as a thought, she was again beside me, binding up my hand, laying it in her bosom, moaning and mourning over it with dove-like sounds. They were not words that came to her. They were sounds more beautiful than speech, infinitely touching, infinitely tender. And yet, as I lay there, a thought stung to my heart, a thought wounded me like a sword, a thought like a worm in a flower profaned the holiness of my love. Yes, they were beautiful sounds, and they were inspired by human tenderness. But was their beauty human? End of Part Three Part Four of Olalla. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Olalla, by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part Four. All day I lay there. For a long time the cries of that nameless female thing, as she struggled with her half-witted whelp, resounded through the house and pierced me with despairing sorrow and disgust. They were the death-cry of my love. My love was murdered, was not only dead, but an offence to me. And yet think as I pleased, feel as I must, it still swelled within me like a storm of sweetness, and my heart melted at her looks and touch. 
this horror that had sprung out, this doubt upon Olalla, this savage and bestial strain that ran not only through the whole behaviour of her family, but found a place in the very foundations and story of our love, though it appalled, though it shocked and sickened me, was yet not of power to break the knot of my infatuation. When the cries had ceased, there came a scraping at the door, by which I knew Felipe was without, and Olalla went and spoke to him. I know not what. With that exception she stayed close beside me, now kneeling by my bed and fervently praying, now sitting with her eyes upon mine. So then, for these six hours I drank in her beauty, and silently perused the story in her face. I saw the golden coin hover on her breaths, I saw her eyes darken and brighten, and still speak no language but that of an unfathomable kindness. I saw the faultless face, and through the robe, the lines of the faultless body. Night came at last, and in the growing darkness of the chamber, the sight of her slowly melted. But even then the touch of her smooth hand lingered in mine, and talked with me. To lie thus in deadly weakness, and drink in the traits of the beloved, is to reawake to love from whatever shock of disillusion. I reasoned with myself, and I shut my eyes on horrors, and again I was very bold to accept the worst. What mattered it, if that imperious sentiment survived, if her eyes still beckoned and attached me, if now, even as before, every fibre of my dull body yearned and turned to her? Late on in the night some strength revived in me, and I spoke. O oh, Lala, I said, nothing matters. I ask nothing. I am content. I love you." She knelt down a while and prayed, and I devoutly respected her devotions. The moon had begun to shine in upon one side of each of the three windows, and make a misty clearness in the room, by which I saw her indistinctly. When she re-arose, she made the sign of the cross. "'It is for me to speak,' she said, "'and for you to listen. I know. You can but guess. I prayed, how I prayed for you to leave this place. I begged it of you, and I know you would have granted me even this, or if not, oh, let me think so." "'I love you,' I said. "'And yet you have lived in the world,' she said, after a pause, "'you who are a man and wise, and I am but a child. Forgive me, if I seem to teach, who am as ignorant as the trees of the mountain. But those who learn much do but skim the face of knowledge. They seize the laws, they conceive the dignity of the design, and the horror of the living fact fades from their memory. It is we who sit at home with evil who remember, I think, and are warned and pity. Go, rather, go now, and keep me in mind. So I shall have a life in the cherished places of your memory, a life as much my own as that which I lead in this body." I love you," I said once more, and reaching out my weak hand, took hers, and carried it to my lips, and kissed it. Nor did she resist, but winced a little, and I could see her look upon me, with a frown that was not unkindly, only sad and baffled. And then it seemed she made a call upon her resolution, plucked my hand towards her, herself at the same time leaning somewhat forward, and laid it on the beating of her heart. There, she cried, you feel the very footfall of my life. It only moves for you. It is yours. But is it even mine? It is mine indeed to offer you, as I might take the coin from my neck, as I might break a live branch from a tree and give it you. And yet not mine. I dwell, or I think I dwell, if I exist at all, somewhere apart, an impotent prisoner, and carried about and defended by a mob that I disown. This capsule, such as throbs against the sides of animals, knows you at a touch for its master. Aye, it loves you. But my soul, does my soul? I think not. I know not, fearing to ask. Yet when you spoke to me your words were of the soul, it is of the soul that you ask, it is only from the soul that you would take me." O oh, Lala, I said, the soul and the body are one, and mostly so in love. What the body chooses, the soul loves, where the body clings, the soul cleaves. 
body for body, soul to soul, they come together at God's signal, and the lower part, if we can call aught low, is only the footstool and foundation of the highest. Have you, she said, seen the portraits in the house of my fathers? Have you looked at my mother or at Felipe? Have your eyes never rested on that picture that hangs by your bed? She who sat for it died ages ago, and she did evil in her life. But look again. There is my hand to the least line. There are my eyes and my hair. What is mine, then, and what am I? If not a curve in this poor body of mine, which you love, and for the sake of which you dotingly dream that you love me, not a gesture that I can frame, not a tone of my voice, not any look from my eyes, no, not even now when I speak to him I love, but has belonged to others. Others, ages dead, have wooed other men with my eyes, other men have heard the pleading of the same voice that now sounds in your ears. The hands of the dead are in my bosom, they move me, they pluck me, they guide me, I am a puppet at their command, and I but re-inform features and attributes that have long been laid aside from evil in the quiet of the grave. Is it me you love, friend, or the race that made me, the girl who does not know and cannot answer for the least portion of herself, or the stream of which she is a transitory eddy, the tree of which she is the passing fruit? The race exists. It is old, it is ever young, it carries its eternal destiny in its bosom. Upon it, like waves upon the sea, individual succeeds to individual, mocked with a semblance of self-control. But they are nothing. We speak of the soul, but the soul is in the race. "'You fret against the common law,' I said. You rebel against the voice of God, which he has made so winning to convince, so imperious to command. Hear it, and how it speaks between us. Your hand clings to mine, your heart leaps at my touch, the unknown elements of which we are compounded awake and run together at a look. The clay of the earth remembers its independent life and yearns to join us. We are drawn together as the stars are turned about in space, or as the tides ebb and flow, by things older and greater than we ourselves. Alas, she said, what can I say to you? My fathers, eight hundred years ago, ruled all this province. They were wise, great, cunning, and cruel. They were a picked race of the Spanish, their flags led in war. The king called them his cousin. The people, when the rope was slung for them, or when they returned and found their hovels smoking, blasphemed their name. Presently a change began. Man has risen. If he has sprung from the brutes, he can descend again to the same level. The breath of weariness blew on their humanity, and the cords relaxed. They began to go down. Their minds fell on sleep. Their passions awoke in gusts, heady and senseless like the wind in the gutters of the mountains. Beauty was still handed down, but no longer the guiding wit nor the human heart. The seed passed on. It was wrapped in flesh, the flesh covered the bones, but they were the bones and the flesh of brutes, and their mind was as the mind of flies. I speak to you as I dare, but you have seen for yourself how the wheel has gone backward with my doomed race. I stand, as it were, upon a little rising ground in this desperate descent, and see both before and behind, both what we have lost and to what we are condemned to go farther downward. And shall I, I that dwell apart in the house of the dead, my body loathing its ways, shall I repeat the spell? Shall I bind another spirit, reluctant as my own, into this bewitched and tempest-broken tenement that I now suffer in? Shall I hand down this cursed vessel of humanity, charge it with fresh life as with fresh poison, and dash it like a fire in the faces of posterity? But my vow has been given. The race shall cease from off the earth. At this hour my brother is making ready. His foot will soon be on the stair, and you will go with him and pass out of my sight for ever. Think of me sometimes as one to whom the lesson of life was very harshly told, but who heard it with courage as one who loved you indeed, but who hated herself so deeply that her love was hateful to her, as one who sent you away and yet would have longed to keep you for ever, who had no dearer hope than to forget you, and no greater fear than to be forgotten. 
she had drawn towards the door as she spoke, her rich voice sounding softer and farther away, and with the last word she was gone, and I lay alone in the moonlit chamber. What I might have done had I not lain bound by my extreme weakness, I know not, but as it was there fell upon me a great and blank despair. It was not long before there shone at the door the ruddy glimmer of a lantern, and Felipe coming, charged me without a word upon his shoulders, and carried me down to the great gate, where the cart was waiting. In the moonlight the hills stood out sharply, as if they were of cardboard. On the glimmering surface of the plateau, and from among the low trees which swung together and sparkled in the wind, the great black cube of the residencia stood out bulkily, its mass only broken by three dimly lighted windows in the northern front above the gate. They were Olalla's windows, and as the cart jolted onwards I kept my eyes fixed upon them, till where the road dipped into a valley they were lost to my view for ever. Felipe walked in silence beside the shafts, but from time to time he would check the mule and seem to look back upon me, and at length drew quite near and laid his hand upon my head. There was such kindness in the touch, and such a simplicity, as of the brutes, that tears broke from me like the bursting of an artery. "'Felipe,' I said, "'take me where they will ask no questions.' He never said a word, but he turned his mule about, end for end, retraced some part of the way we had gone, and, striking into another path, led me to the mountain village, which was, as we say in Scotland, the Kirkton of that thinly peopled district. Some broken memories dwell in my mind of the day breaking over the plain, of the cart stopping, of arms that helped me down, of a bare room into which I was carried, and of a swoon that fell upon me like sleep. The next day and the days following, the old priest was often at my side with his snuff-box and prayer-book, and after a while, when I began to pick up strength, he told me that I was now on a fair way to recovery, and must as soon as possible hurry my departure. Whereupon, without naming any reason, he took snuff and looked at me sideways. I did not affect ignorance. I knew he must have seen Olalla. "'Sir,' said I, "'you know that I do not ask in wantonness. What of that family?" He said they were very unfortunate, that it seemed a declining race, and that they were very poor, and had been much neglected. "'But she has not,' I said. Thanks, doubtless, to yourself, she is instructed and wise beyond the use of women." "'Yes,' he said, "'the senorita is well informed, but the family has been neglected.' "'The mother?' I queried. Yes, the mother too, said the padre, taking snuff, but Felipe is a well-intentioned lad. The mother is odd, I asked. Very odd, replied the priest. I think, sir, we beat about the bush, said I. You must know more of my affairs than you allow. You must know my curiosity to be justified on many grounds. Will you not be frank with me? My son, said the old gentleman, I will be very frank with you on matters within my competence. On those of which I know nothing it does not require much discretion to be silent. I will not fence with you. I take your meaning perfectly. And what can I say but that we are all in God's hands, and that His ways are not as our ways? I have even advised with my superiors in the Church, but they, too, were dumb. It is a great mystery." "'Is she mad?' I asked. I will answer you according to my belief. She is not, returned the padre, or she was not. When she was young—God help me, I fear I neglected that wild lamb—she was surely sane, and yet, although it did not run to such heights, the same strain was already notable. It had been so before her and her father. I, and before him, and this inclined me, perhaps, to think too lightly of it. But these things go on growing not only in the individual, but in the race. "'When she was young,' I began, and my voice failed me for a moment, and it was only with a great effort that I was able to add, "'Was she like Olalla?' "'Now God forbid!' exclaimed the Padre. "'God forbid that any man should think so slightingly of my favourite penitent. No, no, the Senorita, but for her beauty, which I wish most honestly she had less of, has not a hair's resemblance to what her mother was at that same age. I could not bear to have you think so. 
though heaven knows it were, perhaps, better that you should." At this I raised myself in bed, and opened my heart to the old man, telling him of our love, and of her decision, owning to my own horrors, my own passing fancies, but telling him that these were at an end, and with something more than a purely formal submission, appealing to his judgment. He heard me very patiently and without surprise, and when I had done, he sat for some time silent. Then he began, "'The Church,' and instantly broke off again to apologize. "'I had forgotten, my child, that you were not a Christian,' said he. "'And, indeed, upon a point so highly unusual, even the Church can scarce be said to have decided. But would you have my opinion? The Senorita is, in a matter of this kind, the best judge. I would accept her judgment." On the back of that he went away, nor was he thenceforward so assiduous in his visits. Indeed, even when I began to get about again, he plainly feared and deprecated my society, not as in distaste, but much as a man might be disposed to flee from the riddling sphinx. The villagers, too, avoided me. They were unwilling to be my guides upon the mountain. I thought they looked at me askance, and I made sure that the more superstitious crossed themselves on my approach. At first I set this down to my heretical opinions, but it began at length to dawn upon me that if I was thus redoubted it was because I had stayed at the residencia. All men despise the savage notions of such peasantry, and yet I was conscious of a chill shadow that seemed to fall and dwell upon my love. It did not conquer, but I may not deny that it restrained my ardour. Some miles westward of the village there was a gap in the Sierra, from which the eye plunged direct upon the residencia, and thither it became my daily habit to repair. A wood crowned the summit, and just where the pathway issued from its fringes, it was overhung by a considerable shelf of rock, and that in its turn was surmounted by a crucifix of the size of life, and more than usually painful in design. This was my perch. Thence, day after day, I looked down upon the plateau, and the great old house, and could see Felipe, no bigger than a fly, going to and fro about the garden. Sometimes mists would draw across the view, and be broken up again by mountain winds. Sometimes the plain slumbered below me in unbroken sunshine. It would sometimes be blotted out by rain. This distant post, these interrupted sights of the place where my life had been so strangely changed, suited the indecision of my humour. I passed whole days there, debating with myself the various elements of our position, now leaning to the suggestions of love, now giving an ear to prudence, and in the end halting irresolute between the two. One day, as I was sitting on my rock, there came by that way a somewhat gaunt peasant wrapped in a mantle. He was a stranger, and plainly did not know me even by repute, for instead of keeping the other side, he drew near and sat down beside me, and we had soon fallen in talk. Among other things he told me he had been a muleteer, and in former years had much frequented these mountains. Later on he had followed the army with his mules, had realized a competence, and was now living retired with his family. "'Do you know that house?' I inquired at last, pointing to the residencia for I readily wearied of any talk that kept me from the thought of Olalla. He looked at me darkly, and crossed himself. "'Too well,' he said. It was there that one of my comrades sold himself to Satan. The virgin shield us from temptations. He has paid the price. He is now burning in the reddest place in hell." A fear came upon me. I could answer nothing, and presently the man resumed as if to himself. "'Yes,' he said. "'Oh, yes, I know it. I have passed its doors. There was snow upon the pass, the wind was driving it, sure enough there was death that night upon the mountains, but there was worse beside the hearth. I took him by the arm, Senor, and dragged him to the gate. I conjured him, by all he loved and respected, to go forth with me. I went on my knees before him in the snow, and I could see he was moved by my entreaty. And just then she came out on the gallery, and called him by his name, and he turned, and there was she, standing with a lamp in her hand, and smiling on him to come back. I cried out aloud to God, and threw my arms about him, but he put me by, and left me alone. He had made his choice. God help us! I would pray for him, but to what end? There are sins that not even the Pope can loose." "'And your friend,' I asked, "'what became of him?' Nay. God knows," said the muleteer. 
If all be true that we hear, his end was like his sin, a thing to raise the hair. Do you mean that he was killed? I asked. Sure enough he was killed, returned the man. But how? Ay, how? But there are things that it is sin to speak of. The people of that house, I began. But he interrupted me with a savage outburst. The people, he cried. What people? There are neither men nor women in that house of Satan's. What, have you lived here so long and never heard? And here he put his mouth to my ear and whispered, as if even the fowls of the mountain might have overheard him and been stricken with horror. What he told me was not true, nor was it even original, being indeed but a new addition, vamped up again by village ignorance and superstition, of stories nearly as ancient as the race of man. It was rather the application that appalled me. In the old days, he said, the church would have burned out that nest of basilisks, but the arm of the church was now shortened. His friend Miguel had been unpunished by the hands of men, and left to the more awful judgment of an offended God. This was wrong, but it should be so no more. The padre was sunk in age, he was even bewitched himself, but the eyes of his flock were now awake to their own danger, and some day— I, and before long, the smoke of that house should go up to heaven. He left me filled with horror and fear. Which way to turn I knew not, whether to first warn the padre, or to carry my ill news direct to the threatened inhabitants of the residencia. Fate was to decide for me, for while I was still hesitating, I beheld the veiled figure of a woman drawing near to me up the pathway. No veil could deceive my penetration. By every line and every movement I recognized Olalla, and keeping hidden behind a corner of the rock, I suffered her to gain the summit. Then I came forward. She knew me and paused, but did not speak. I too remained silent, and we continued for some time to gaze upon each other with a passionate sadness. "'I thought you had gone,' she said at length. "'It is all that you can do for me, to go. It is all I have ever asked of you. And you still stay.' But do you know that every day heaps up the peril of death, not only on your head, but on ours? A report has gone about the mountain. It is thought you love me, and the people will not suffer it." I saw she was already informed of her danger, and I rejoiced at it. O oh, Lala, I said, I am ready to go this day, this very hour, but not alone. She stepped aside and knelt down before the crucifix to pray, and I stood by and looked now at her and now at the object of her adoration, now at the living figure of the penitent, and now at the ghastly daubed countenance, the painted wounds and the projected ribs of the image. The silence was only broken by the wailing of some large birds that circled sidelong, as if in surprise or alarm, about the summit of the hills. Presently Olalla rose again, turned towards me, raised her veil, and still leaning with one hand on the shaft of the crucifix, looked upon me with a pale and sorrowful countenance. "'I have laid my hand upon the cross,' she said. "'The Padre says you are no Christian. But look up for a moment with my eyes, and behold the face of the man of sorrows. We are all such as he was, the inheritors of sin. We must all bear and expiate a past which was not ours. There is in all of us, I even in me, a sparkle of the divine. Like him we must endure for a little while, until morning returns bringing peace. Suffer me to pass on upon my way alone. It is thus that I shall be least lonely, counting for my friend him who is the friend of all the distressed. It is thus that I shall be the most happy, having taken my farewell of earthly happiness, and willingly accepted sorrow for my portion." I looked at the face of the crucifix and though I was no friend to images, and despised that imitative and grimacing art of which it was a rude example, some sense of what the thing implied was carried home to my intelligence. The face looked down upon me with a painful and deadly contraction, but the rays of a glory encircled it, and reminded me that the sacrifice was voluntary. It stood there, crowning the rock as it still stands on so many highway sides, vainly preaching to passers-by, an emblem of sad and noble truths, that pleasure is not an end, but an accident, that pain is the choice of the magnanimous, that it is best to suffer all things, and do well. I turned and went down the mountain in silence, 
and when I looked back for the last time before the wood closed about my path, I saw Olalla still leaning on the crucifix. End of Part 4 End of Olalla